So today, um, as you all know from the last uh, evening as well as today, uh, I mean yesterday, the whole uh, idea of um, the conference is around institutions and public policy. Um, but it is also, I think, an opportunity for young scholars. There was a very deliberate uh, attempt, um, as Jotsna has mentioned, to bring young scholars into the conversation because I think there are, you know, um, as Aruna Roy said, dimin diminishing, you know, spaces for conversations of the kind. And I think as um, uh, Shanta Sina actually pointed out, you know, the youth to be involved is actually very critical. And to youth, to have critical thinking uh, facilities or spaces is actually important. So we wanted to bring together young voices as well into the conference. And we also wanted, I think, people experienced in the field to be able to provide certain forms of perspective to them, as well as provide, you know, th there is uh, something about the mingling of the two, because there are certain forms of new ideas and new energies, but also have the kinds of the weight of the experience that kind of provides, you know, uh, sort of directionality to those new ideas, energies, and hopes. Uh, so, I mean, that's the idea of this panel as well, because we have actually very three <laughs> very eminent scholars, and I think the young scholars here must, uh, I mean, you are very fortunate because I wish I had these kinds of opportunities when I was a young scholar to be able to hear and to have the opportunity for, uh, um, for you know, um, experienced scholars to hear your ideas and then to give you certain forms of feedback. And so I hope this conversation goes on longer than the one hour that we, ha I mean, the three hours that we have today. Uh, with that, let me introduce you to the panelists. Our invited speaker is uh, Dr. Srinath Reddy. He is an honorary distinguished professor at the Public Health Foundation of India, and he has been the president, uh, past president of the Public Health Foundation, and was formerly the Department of Cardiology at All India Institute of Medical Science, Ames. Uh, in March 2017, he was appointed as the advisor on health to the government of Odisha with the uh, rank of a cabinet minister. He's also an advisor on health uh, to government of, um, government of Andhra Pradesh with cabinet rank from March 2020. Uh, he is a member of the Government of India Technical Task Force for COVID-19. Thank you, sir, for gracing us and for coming on to this uh, panel. I'll introduce uh, the other. Yes, please. Please do apologize. Uh, yeah, uh, welcome him to the panel. I would also like to introduce um, Mr. JVR Prasad, who is actually part of our uh, uh, society and board. Uh, he is a former Union uh, Health Secretary, Government of India, and is a special advisor to UNAIDS. He was also the special envoy to the Secretary General of the United Nations on HIV AIDS um, for the Asia Pacific region from 2013 to 17. And as Secretary for Health and Family Welfare from 2002 to 2004, he's made immense contributions to health sector's development and was instrumental in drafting the National AIDS Prevention and Control Policy and the National Blood Transfusion Policy of India. And he has been our ex-president of the CBPS board. We welcome you, sir, to this uh, wonderful panel. Thank you. Uh, Professor Vyaslu requires actually no introduction, but do you, would you like me to give you one? So he is our current president. And um, those of you who were fortunate enough to hear him, you know uh, his uh, contributions to, uh, to, the, to the ideas of economic ideas, budget, the, the entire framework of CBPS. Actually, he's very, I mean, he is the person who sort of set us up. So um, thank you all for coming. And uh, Pro Professor um, Reddy, on, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you very much for that very gracious introduction. It is with a sense of trepidation that actually I came here and that has only increased. I was not very certain as to what was expected of me in this talk, whether it was to be specifically on a particular topic of public health, universal health coverage or health system challenges to India or some other area. But then I spoke to Dr. Jotsna and then she said, very much in keeping with the theme of the conference, it should be much more about the role of public institutions in shaping policy and supporting the communities in achieving their rights. And yesterday's talks gave me that orientation. So you'll forgive me if I will not get into very specific topics like, for example, 
non-communicable diseases, or universal health coverage, or other areas, though I'll touch upon some of them in my talk. But my trepidation has further increased, hemmed in as I am by two giants, and certainly that is an area that I cannot remedy at the moment, since I cannot escape this hall. So I shall then proceed with my talk as planned. Indeed, coming out of COVID-19 pandemic, which is still not yet gone, in fact, the WHO still calls it a public health emergency of international concern. But nevertheless, with Omicron, we've had some relief, and now we can look to the future and look at the tasks that still await us. And one of them, very clearly, is whether we are on track to achieve the sustainable development goals of 2030. We have lost time during COVID, but there is a sense of urgency that we must try and attain, or at least gain considerable distance in our journey towards the sustainable development goals by 2030. Therein, I believe health becomes absolutely important because I see health as the most important summative indicator of success across all sustainable development goals. Because virtually health and each of those other goals are bi-directionally related. Health influences them and health in turn is greatly influenced by them. And therefore health becomes absolutely pivotal to human welfare and human development. Health is pivotal both at the individual level and at the societal level. At the individual level, there is both an intrinsic value and an instrumental value. The intrinsic value is by way of survival, physical and cognitive growth, a sense of well-being, functionality, self-care, sexual and reproductive functions, and creativity. It has an instrumental value in providing opportunity to access and utilize education to gain a useful occupation, income, social status, participate in social networks, competitive sports, performing arts, all of them will require an individual to be healthy, but that certainly is of instrumental value. At the societal level, we clearly recognize that health is again an important accelerator of economic development at the population level and also provides social stability because a society where many people are unhealthy does not really bode well for social stability. And it also helps to accelerate scientific and technological progress which lifts up the level of human civilization. So health becomes absolutely critical. But we also recognize that there are several determinants of health which are social, economic, environmental, and commercial, and that many of these influence the biology of individuals and ultimately reflect upon their health status. At the individual level, we have an interplay of biology, beliefs, and behaviors. At the family and community level, we have perceptions of what health means, priorities of what we choose, whether we choose to buy healthy food for our family, or whether we spend it on tobacco or alcohol, priorities also matter. And pathways do we have access, for example, to tobacco free spaces? Do we have community spaces where we can actually have safe and pleasurable physical activity? There are many other areas which actually are at the family and community level. At the national and global level, more upstream, but definitely now becoming much more important. Uh, is the level of development, the stage and speed of development, the distributional issues of equity, and the demand and supply issues of trade. So all of these ultimately impact upon the health of the individual. But then we also recognize that health is a human right. And this we recognize from the capabilities argument of Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum. And we recognize that while health itself is seen as a capability, it is actually the result of many other capabilities and it exists in conjunction with those capabilities, what Martha Nussbaum calls the meta-capability and what Sridhar 
uh, Venkatapuram is called as a cluster of capabilities. So it is, in his book, Health Justice. So what Sridhar Venkatapuram says very rightly is that we need to protect and promote that cluster of capabilities so that each individual has the ability to attain growth and development to his or her fullest potential, which then becomes his or her right, right to health. So given that, we do require to look at what role institutions also can play. If that right has to be protected through collective actions at the societal level, then independent institutions that generate, translate, apply, and evaluate knowledge must play an active role. Indeed, these institutions generate not only knowledge, but also foster values which enable that knowledge to be applied for social good. Therefore, we are really looking at institutions which promote both science and sensibility. Now, I've always believed that science has a social mission. And since we are really talking about public policy, and we hope that science, defined in the broadest sense, aids public policy, science is sterile if it lacks a social purpose and must connect with public policy. And public policy will crumble on clay feet if it does not stand on the strong base of sound science. So these are indeed interrelated. Now, we recognize that when we are really undertaking a scientific pursuit, we are trying our best to get to the closest approximation of truth. Absolute truth <coughs> is only for divinity and like-minded clinicians, not for everybody else. So we recognize that to ap approach that truth to the closest approximation, we move from observation to inference, but we have to wrestle in that process with chance, bias, variance, and confounding. But now we are also having to deal with fraud, which is totally unexpected, but now very much an important factor that we have to look at. But then all of these help us to establish internal validity. But then we also have to look at external validity, which brings us to the context and how generalizable the results are. Then we have to look at replicability, because that is one of the canons of science, that a single solitary study could have arisen by chance alone. Therefore, we look for replicability as well. Apart from, of course, if there are multiple studies, you can try and do meta-analysis as well. But while doing this, you're dealing with uncertainty. And we try and define that uncertainty through our confidence intervals or uncertainty band. But we are also dealing with complexity, increasingly dealing with complexity, where our linear models of investigation fall short. Nate Silva has been a very remarkable analyst who started his life with baseball scores and baseball analysis. And his success led, me, led him to electoral field in United States presidential elections. Until recently, he has been having a remarkable run of success in predicting state-by-state state result with great accuracy. And he's one of the best analysts. He's a good statistician. And he believes ardently in Bayesian analytics. And to quote Nate Silva, information becomes knowledge only when it is placed in context. Without it, we have no way to differentiate the signal from noise, and our search for truth might be stamped with false positives. So that brings us to the whole area of context, and where we have to really look at context in terms of the population groups who are actually being analyzed or to whom the results of your scientific research may or may not be applicable. And that is where policy has to be guided by that awareness of context, but also in resolving certain uncertainties. We are dealing with uncertainties all through. We are dealing with epistemic uncertainty, which is the don't know uncertainty, and the aleatory uncertainty, which is the can't know uncertainty. But when we deal with data, we try and, try and resolve a bit of that aleatory uncertainty. But we need to know the prior probability 
in order to understand how to deal with the epistemic uncertainty and then we derive the posterior probability or the post-test probability and then we try and resolve our uncertainty system best. So likelihood ratio which is derived from the data deals with aleatory uncertainty whereas the pre and post-test probabilities try and deal with the epistemic uncertainty. And all of this, we need to deal with this. But COVID-19 has also taught us about complexity. Just look at what COVID has taught us. The virus and its variants, the speed which, which they have changed, the multiple forms that have evolved, including the Omicron family. Last night, I was actually in a WHO panel where Yesterday, I believe, that I was dealing with a different aspect, but we were informed that they're having problems because Omicron has been described as a variant of concern. Now, all the sub-variants and sub-lineages that have emerged have very low virulence, so they really can't be called variants of concern. So now they're trying to revise the nomenclature. So there is that complexity. The transmission dynamics, is it droplets? Is it uh, aerosol spread? Or is it both? Vaccines, how do you actually create vaccines from multiple platforms and how do you adapt them to emerging variants? What about drugs? Again, a variety, how effective are they as antiviral drugs or anti-inflammatory drugs? The non-pharmacological interventions like policies and practices, masks, lockdowns, behaviors, both of individuals and of groups, international cooperation and the unknowns, all of these add to complexity even in COVID. And complexity exists everywhere. And unfortunately, much of our research has led us entirely on linear models of research. And we have never wrestled with complexity in the manner that we need to. Therefore, if you apply systems thinking to complexity, we recognize that there are a large number of dynamically interacting elements a wide diversity of elements, there is emergence of new variables from this interaction, unexpected variability, path dependence, self-organization, and resilience. Now, we have to deal with the fact that we still use our knowledge, and including the linear models, in order to identify the specific attributable associations and try and judge them by causal inference to the extent possible by applying other methods. But we must remember in the context of complexity that the spectrum of science is reductionist in content but holistic in context. Unless we understand the context, we can never apply it and utilize it the manner it ought to be. So what is the purpose of research in health? I believe the purpose of research in health is to provide evidence-informed, context-relevant, resource-optimizing, culturally adaptive, and equity-promoting recommendations for policy and practice. I'm not saying evidence-based, because evidence-based has acquired a particular meaning, quite often rest, resting around randomized control trials. Randomized control trials are not the only where we get evidence, I mean, apart from qualitative research and quantitative methods, which are, again are important. There are so many other methods, including observational methods, including hypothesis generation, ecological studies, all of which we probably need to take into account. Therefore, I'm using evidence informed, including experiential wisdom of communities. Context relevant, I'm not saying context specific, because there could be similar context to which the knowledge is transferable or portable. Resource optimizing, I'm not saying resource sensitive. We were just discussing that the fiscal space seems to be an artificial construct in which it appears that the resources can never be increased. Certainly resources can be increased if there is intent to do that. But at any given time, you still have to make the best use of those available resources, whether it's financial or human. So it has to be resource optimizing and culturally adaptive, compatible to the extent, but culture is fairly dynamic and potentially changes and therefore it's culturally adaptive and equity promoting. I believe evidence and equity are absolutely essential and they should be seen as sine qua non. But then again, there was some discussion yesterday on 
how evidence is related to policy. We must train to recognize that there is evidence for policy and evidence on policy, which are somewhat different. Because, for example, if somebody asks, should we have taxation on ultra-processed foods? Should we increase the taxes? The immediate question that comes from a policymaker is, where is the evidence? Who has tried it out? Then we have to say, OK, is it sound economic theory that if you increase taxes, probably the consumption will go down? Of course, there are limits of elasticity. Also, is there analogous evidence when taxes were increased on tobacco, did not tobacco consumption go down, and which are the countries where it went down? And secondly, if there is a clear-cut risk association of ultra-processed foods with harmful health consequences, should we not try and reduce the consumption by taking this measure and then evaluating its impact rather than do nothing? So those are the kind of arguments we may have to marshal for evidence for policy. But once policy is initiated, you still have to definitely evaluate the impact, and that's evidence on policy as it is being implemented. Now, in terms of policy, what does policy need? Bismarck, the German chancellor said uh, of the 19th century, said there are two things that should not be watched while they're being made, sausages and public policy. <laughs> so pretty messy. Uh, but nevertheless, even enlightened policy, which is not capricious policy, needs scientific credibility. It requires evidence and rationale. So it requires biomedical research, epidemiological research, and clinical research. It needs financial feasibility. Is it cost effective? Is it affordable? So it requires health economics research. Operational stability. Is it operationally steerable through the system that exists? Is it sustainable? Is it scalable? It requires health systems research or implementation research. It also requires political viability. Is there a ready and receptive constituency to accept it among the policymakers, among the practitioners, among the public? Who is opposing? Who is supporting? So what are the barriers that the policy is likely to make in terms of social resistance? Now, that requires social science research. So when we're talking about scientific credibility, financial feasibility, operational stability, and political viability, it's absolutely clear that we require multidisciplinary research. And we cannot really make viable policy without undertaking that. Now, this brings us into the need for looking at multiple streams of data and how best to coalesce them and combine them to make the max best sense out of it. Now, that is where, unfortunately, many of the existing institutions of the state do not provide that opportunity for creating a broad platform for bringing in all of the data together and understanding how the data, data sets in play with each other, interplay apart from the context, of course. So there, even academic institutions do tend to fail sometimes, but there is a greater opportunity for independent institutions and academic institutions to try and bring multiple data sets together, multiple streams of knowledge together, and try and integrate them, and try and enable policy to be made in a much more rational manner, and in a much more contextually appropriate manner. Now we are talking about big data, let me quote a poem from Edna St. Vincent Millay, quote, Upon this gifted age, in its dark hour, rains from heaven the sky, a meteoric shower of facts. They lie unquestioned, uncombined. Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there is no loom to weave it into a fabric. And that is where institutions must come together as the loom to weave that into a fabric, a fabric of knowledge which brings the best of learning from multiple disciplines, multiple research enterprises, and sets it in the context and tries to reduce the complexity or at least adapt the knowledge to the complexity that is there so that it can actually feed into policy and into practice. Now, why do you need independent institutions? Is the state 
not capable of doing it on its own. There are multiple areas of data generation from state agencies. And we have plenty of them around, and I'm not going to get into which of them is better or which of them is fallible. All of you are analyzing them, the NFHS, NSS, all of that you are analyzing day in and day out. I'm not going to get into those. But Rukmini S. in her book, Whole Numbers and Half-Truths, says there are five cardinal sins in data infrastructure. Not collecting essential data, not collating or publishing existing data in usable ways, obfuscating or suppressing some data, overselling data well beyond what it really says, and knee-jerk criticism of inconvenient data. Now, we see this happening all through, and not only by the state, but by others too. So, but particularly when we are dependent upon state agencies for supplying the data, when I'm, then we have challenges because we are unable to verify much of the data that's connected. And there, it is absolutely necessary that independent agencies both critique the data where possible or collect data which is independent and verifiable so that they can actually provide a picture which may be closer to the truth. Now, there is a good paper published in, uh, the, by the Munich University on their website. I was wondering why University of Munich, but Shama Nagarajan and others in 2018 published this paper, uh, Challenges of Health Information Systems in India. The challenges identified at the national level are different sources, divergent figures, methods, and periodicity being variable. And for example, NFHS and the HMIS data d have disagreements because of differences in methods as well as differences in periodicity. Non-standardized, decentralized procurement of national uh, human resource information. It is such a difficult exercise to find out how many doctors are actually there in India, how many of them are actually within the system functioning, how many are dead or retired, how many have gone abroad, these numbers, and similarly about nurses, similarly about others, because multiple data sets are actually conflicting with each other and you have different analysis coming from different data sets. Lack of centralized mechanism for linking data across sources. Data dissemination and utilization challenges. These are at the national level. Issues at the subnational level are lack of private sector data. Because quite often the state collects data from its own agencies and much of the private sector data in health is totally a black box. You don't know anything about what's happening in the private sector whether it is even for notifiable diseases, they don't always notify. And for many other conditions, you just can't get information out of them. Uh, then limited disaggregation of data. That's another major problem. Uh, we do not have district level, block level data, and quite often that becomes important as well. Issues in data compilation and uh, analysis. Lack of training on probing skills shortage of staff, intrinsic data quality issues like methodological issues, data triangulation issues, incons inconsistent data definitions across survey rounds. I'm not going to go into this. You might actually look at the paper from the website. It's available from the University of Munich website. You, you can Google it and get it. But it's very good. The other question that comes up about is since we are dealing considerably with health and also economic development, particularly in this institution. There is a clear-cut bi-directional relationship, as I said. Population, health, and economic development are very much related, and poverty and ill health at the individual level are related. But why is it that health has not received the kind of attention from economists that it should have had? William Baumol, one of the most influential economists from the United States, in the second half of the last century, and even in the early years of this century, he passed on in 2015, described health care as a cost disease. He said, unlike industry 
agriculture service sectors which generate wealth, health consumes wealth and its economic returns from investments in health are not commensurate with those investments. It's more of a social obligation but not an economically productive investment. And that philosophy actually prevailed for quite some time. And that colored even our own planning process. Of course, we had then two reports on investing in health, one from the World Bank, slightly skewed, 1993, then in 2013, again investing in health from the Lancet Commission. But also in the late 19, by 2001, uh, the WHO Macroeconomics Commission on Health, headed by Jeff Sachs, all of which made the case very clearly that absolutely health and economic development are related. Health is essential for economic growth, and that becomes absolutely important. And in 2016, there's a UN report of a commission headed by uh, Zuma and Sarkozy, both presidents at that time, no longer, saying that investment in human resources for health generates employment, which is a very strong economic growth factor. That again counters what's called the Bermal effect. So we have very clear-cut evidence that investment in health is required. And that brings us to universal health coverage. Universal health coverage is clearly a target under the Sustainable Development Goals, target 3.8. Now, universal health coverage is basically defined as that everybody should get access to health services that they need of assured quality at any given time in their life course without suffering financial hardship. Now, that appears to be, on the face of it, a bit utopian, because you can say, if everybody has to get all the health care they want or need, more need than want, do we have the resources to provide that? So WHO has come up with a cube, a three-dimensional cube. One is population coverage, the one dimension. Second is service coverage. Third is cost coverage. The population coverage is what proportion of the population does the scheme cover? Second, service coverage. What are the actual clinical or other health services that are included under the service? Need not be only clinical, because universal health coverage, even according to WHO, is defined as including health promotion, disease prevention, diagnostics, therapeutics, rehabilitation, and palliation. But what are the services included? And the third is cost coverage. How much of the cost is covered so that the out-of-pocket expenditure is reduced, poverty created by health expenditure is reduced, at the same time while maintaining f fiscal prudence so that the budget doesn't go bust. Now, the perspectives of the various stakeholders differ here. They that the politicians would prefer as much population coverage as possible, even if the service coverage is shallow. Because the more people who are claimed to be beneficiaries, more the voters. I'm not saying that politicians don't think of equity, but certainly they think of pleasing the voters as well. Clinicians would like to look at the service package. They would like to include as many services as possible because my patient deserves the best, whether it is a cochlear implant or a heart transplant or expensive chemotherapy, my patient deserves the best. Whereas civil servants and Economists in the Niti Aayog and Planning Commission, those who manage the budget lines, they look at cost coverage and say, how much impact can we have on healthcare-related poverty to reduce that vulnerability and still maintain fiscal prudence, which is what they argue. Now, there's a dynamic tension between these three groups, and that has to be resolved by developing a benefit package which reconciles these to the extent possible, but can be expanded, modified as more resources accrue. But even here, we have to look at not only the disease burden, the proven efficacy of interventions, the cost effectiveness of interventions, but also 
the equity dimension. Because quite often people only look at cost effectiveness. But we have to look at the equity dimension and we have to look at it from a point of view of two dimensions. The equality, which is horizontal equity, where everybody gets all the same similar services. And those who have been disadvantaged, who have suffered health inequity, they have to get additional services or additional resources, which is the <coughs> vertical component of equity. And you need to reconcile all of them in your package. And there, independent institutions have to play a role in deciding how this package needs to be steered to bridge those gaps in health and to ensure greater health equity. Otherwise, you can have one size fits all uh, type of uh, recommendation. So those become important as well. Now, as far as the UHC indicators are concerned, we are really looking at the level of financial protection as well as service coverage. B financial protection measured by out-of-pocket expenditure and catastrophic health expenditure and healthcare-related poverty. But service coverage is also important because if you have very low service coverage, you can have an artificially low out-of-pocket expenditure because then you have foregone care. If, if I know that there is no service available, I'm not even attempting to get that service, so I'm not spending out of my pocket. So you need to have both service coverage and uh, financial protection indices measured. Now, in order to get an accurate information about the service coverage, you need independent institutions to do their own studies. You need qualitative research as well to find out what people's perception of service coverage and quality is. So all of these become very important, and without those independent institutions, you can have all kinds of claims about service co about uh, financial protection, which are not necessarily borne out. And even in financial protection, we know that incomplete levels of financial protection were not particularly helpful in schemes, whether it's RSBY or even PMJY, where you still have a lot of out-of-pocket expenditure, a lot of additional costs imposed by the hospitals who are there, and we know that between 2004 and 2014, according to Shamika Ravi's study, that uh, from NSSO studies, that 7% of the population was still being pushed into poverty in 2004 because of unaffordable healthcare expenditure, and 7% again being pushed into poverty in 2014 in, because of unaffordable healthcare expenditure. So these are things that, again, we need independent institutions to point out. We know, and we were speaking about it, that Thailand and Brazil and others have also a greater degree of community engagement. They have village councils, municipal councils, they have national health assemblies, which bring in diverse stakeholders from the academia, from the, from the government agencies, from the civil society, from the service providers, and they sit and debate what progress has been made or where the fault lines have been and the National Health Assembly decides what should be done next year going forward. So it is the democratization of the health system that is, becomes very important, and their independent institutions definitely can and should play a role. Now, there was a question raised yesterday, and there was a good paper also on why is there underspend in the public financing, and it was stated part of it is also because of very delayed release of funds, and that it is actually policy makers sometimes resort to this sleight of hand to show that the budgetary allocation is high, but actually when you come to the actual uh, re uh, the final realized expenditure, then um, it is uh, a much lower amount because they've been controlling the release of funds. Beyond that, there's another reason. If you have a very weak health system, understaffed, under-equipped, you cannot utilize the funds that have been allocated appropriately. Utilize them in time or utilize them appropriately. So you have very little manpower. You have no equipment. You have uh, stockouts because of poor supply chains. Even the funds that are allocated will not be utilized. So there has to be a front-end spending in order to strengthen the health system, in order to increase its ability to absorb and utilize. And that is an argument, again, that has to be made to the policymakers and independent institutions are required to do that. And if there is implementation ineptitude, apart from the policymakers' slate of hand, then again you have to point out why there is inability to spend the money and where are the false lines. 
I'll try and conclude now. Aishman Bharat scheme, particularly the Pradhan Mantri Janarag Yojana, is being described as health assurance. In fact, health assurance is the term we used in the high-level expert group report on universal health coverage. I chaired that for the Planning Commission report of 2011. We said what India needs is not health insurance, but health assurance. PMJ is also a health insurance scheme. It cannot claim to be a health assurance scheme. Health assurance in the ground, they are saying that government will bear up to five lakhs. I see health assurance of or a healthy society as emerging from three concentric circles. Innermost is, of course, health financing. It has to be predominantly tax-funded, particularly in a country where 90% is informal labor, you cannot have salary deductions, where a large number are poor or near poor, you cannot depend entirely on voluntary per private purchase insurance. So it has to be predominantly tax-funded supplemented by employer-provided insurance as well as private insurance. And this is a consensus across most economists that you cannot really have UHC unless there is substantial public investment and public financing. But even the entitlements of that scheme will not be delivered unless you have a functional, competent health system with adequate human resources in health, with medical equipment, devices, vaccines, drugs, particularly drugs because drugs account for uh, outpatient expenditure accounts for 70 percent of um, out-of-pocket expenditure and out of that drugs account for 70 percent so all of these become important then health information systems governance community engagement all of these become important in terms of the health system itself health financing of course is part of that as well so if you actually have adequate health financing within courts, supplemented by a well-functioning health system with all of its components, then you will have universal health coverage. But that still is not a healthy society. That still doesn't provide health assurance to the population. For that, you need to get into the social, economic, environmental, and commercial determinants of health which operate both at the population level through water, sanitation, through food and agriculture systems, through uh, social stability, all of that at the population level, and those that function at the individual level by way of education, occupation, income, gender, participation in social networks, all of these actually are the larger outer circle which frame this universal health coverage and only when you can combine them that you will get universal health, I mean health assurance. And if we really take that as the goal to create a healthy society, then academia has an obligation to partner with the rest of civil society to assist the community in asserting its right to health. Therefore, you do need independent institutions. Again, independent institutions cannot be totally on the sidelines of a debate that involves public welfare. Uh, there has been an argument, particularly in the world of medicine and health, that a scientist should never take sides. It is only for them to generate the knowledge and leave it to the rest of society to interpret and apply. Because scientific objectivity means that you should never take sides. That advocacy is an anathema to scientific objectivity. I do not believe that. It is important for us to try and be as objective as possible while generating the knowledge, while appraising the knowledge that is available. But once we are convinced that there is a certain path to follow, if we do not advocate its utilization for public good, then in a sense we are failing to inform the public as well as the policy makers of what needs to be done. Louis Pasteur so advice to his young researchers is very relevant here. Louis Pasteur told his young researchers, keep your enthusiasm, but let strict verification be its constant companion. And that becomes very important as well. So we have to do that. Now, therefore, we have to engage very much with the community not m merely as a charitable service to the community, but because community is a very key change agent itself. 
quite often we throw up our hands and say multi-sectoral action is something that people want, but it is never going to happen because you're going to see people still functioning in silos, whether in the academia or particularly in policy makers. Every joint secretary has his her own, her own budget and her, sort of her own deliverables. They don't even like to sit with other joint secretaries and decide how everything is going to happen within the same ministry. Why will they sit across ministries and decide to do multi-sectoral action? But either multi-sectoral action requires a very strong political will at the top at the Prime Minister's office level or an Niti Aayog, or, or and it requires mobilization of the community. Because for every family in the community, multi-sectoral action is a lived daily experience. They don't think of water separately, they don't think of food system separately, they don't think of health separately, they don't think of electricity separately, they don't think of road separately. It's part of their daily lived experience. So the community can actually generate the momentum to create that multi-sectoral convergence, particularly in primary healthcare settings, but can even radiate upward. So therefore, it's important for independent institutions to engage with the community because not only to see the community as a beneficiary, but to see the community as a change agent driving this. So there is an action almanac assemble allies, adopt an agreed agenda, <coughs> amplify advocacy, accelerate action, and assert accountability. Toni Morrison, the Nobel laureate who got the Nobel Prize for Literature says, if <coughs> we do not create change, the present will extend itself. So what we need is not a passive commentary on what's happening, but an active participation in making that change happen. And independent institutions can and certainly should play a role. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was, uh, I mean, if there was ever one, there were, that was a master class on health. Uh, and covered, um, I think, everything that we would ever want to know about health as well as, I think, uh, provided so much uh, rich insight, not just, you know, I think uh, yours was definitely a multidisciplinary conversation because it covered poetry, it covered um, the social, the economic, um, the governance, uh, and also I think pro probably, I think we have a lot of, I, I'll provide some space for, I mean, we do have a lot of time when you've, really covered so many things. So we would li I'll open the floor up for question and answer sessions, and I'd like to end the session with comments from Professor Vyaslu and JVR Prasad Rao. So um, because I don't want to uh, take up too much time, uh, the first question, please. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, excellent uh, discussion. I'm, I'm Ranjini. Uh, um, this question is about ASHAs, ANMs, and the health volunteers. They are the uh, foundation uh, in, in this health system. They play a very important role um, in community health, population health, uh, towards uh, uh, universal health coverage. But uh, policy makers have, uh, to an extent, failed to improve their work conditions, their capabilities, and of course, the uh, issue of their pay. So what can be done to improve their uh, condition? ASHAs and ANMs are concerned, we should separate up them out because ANMs are seen as part of the health system. They're paid employees. ASHAs have been described euphemistically as volunteers, though they're paid a stipend now. Initially, they were not even paid, paid a stipend. Uh, before the 2014 election, uh, they were given 500 rupees because there was a demand, and, uh, they, but that was also given as a sort of uh, stipend. Uh, they were being incentivized for immunization and institutional deliveries, but they were, the argument against uh, making them identified part of the official health system was that they will unionize like the Anganwadi workers. So don't consider them, co still call them volunteers. Now that's a problematic area, but nevertheless, I think they ought to be recognized. They need to be protected, even during COVID. Uh, I mean, they had did a tremendous amount of work. Of course, they got the WHO award, 
But uh, on behalf of the National Human Rights Commission, when we actually interviewed the Ashas, uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, travails that they had, not even getting PPE, is not getting anything, uh, so that was problematic, no, 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 not even getting sick leave. So uh, they certainly need far greater attention, a and &Ms too, for that matter. But one of the things that we also must recognize is that now they are being asked to do a lot more. India's health transition means that non-communicable diseases are on the rise. Previously, we, ASHA's responsibility was in the National Rural Health Mission, tailored only to the agenda of the MDGs, which meant maternal and child health, some infectious diseases, and they were being uh, incentivized for institutional deliveries and immunization. Now, with comprehensive primary health care finally being adopted, and this is, is the effect of the SDGs, that you are now looking at NCDs, which are very dominant, mental health issues. Therefore, the area of work has expanded tremendously. One ASHA can't manage all that. Uh, in fact, every time the discussion in the health ministry, everybody who is dealing with a particular program, whatever the program is, wants it to push it onto the ASHAs whereas the ASHAs already have a tremendous amount of workload. So I say, not, not in any derogatory fashion, but purely in a realistic fashion, that ASHA is the goddess of all hopes, but the beast of all burdens. So we need to ensure that the number of ASHAs are increased. In fact, in our HLEG report, we wanted two ASHAs per village to want to take up non-communicable diseases and things like malaria control and others. Uh, Dr. Abhay Bang, who is a member of that commission, committee, said, okay, we'll call one Asha and one Ashok. <laughs> Didn't happen, of course. But uh, ANMs too, we need, uh, everybody has recognized that you require two ANMs. Um, so we need to increase them uh, in numbers, but also increase their salary, social status, and skills, and of course skills. And particularly, technology-enabled ASHAs and ANMs can really do a lot of wonders even for non-communicable diseases, diabetes, hypertension, detection, management. Hello, sir. My, uh, sir, my name is Yogesh Misra. Sir, I want to ask uh, that uh, in uh, last parliamentary session, a private member bill was introduced uh, for the right to health, although it was withdrawn later in, a, in the next session. Uh, do you think that uh, right to health as a fundamental right will create more uh, community participation. As we can see in the case of right to education, uh, we had provided uh, uh, primary education as a fundamental right. So uh, community, uh, community ha uh, can have this right and uh, seeing this uh, mere uh, beneficiary, we can uh, change the discourse as an entitlement. Can, can it uh, help the system to be uh, more robust? Well, there's been a lot of debate on right to health, whether it is just part of the directive principles or whether it can be interpreted in the context of right to life. It is already inherent in the right to life, and whether it needs a separate right or not. There is a belief that it's good to have a right to health enacted because it not only covers the right to health care, but also right to health in the broader dimensions of health in terms of the determinants of health. I mean, you can invoke it for air pollution, you can invoke it for industrial disasters, you can invoke it for so many things. But the reticence has been uh, among the policy makers that it's a difficult right to deliver upon. So that's why they fight shy of it. But I believe like many progressive Latin American countries and others, we ought to enact the right to help. Uh, Rajasthan is doing something about it now. Uh, Rajasthan has a right to health bill. Uh, thank you, sir, for the excellent speech. Uh, you covered a lot of uh, areas, like uh, Navedita said, you took us on a journey through policy, science, and uh, other areas. And especially my key takeaway is uh, on the thing about science that you said. Uh, science is sterile if, you, if there's no mission. I think oftentimes scientists forget that uh, what they set out to do. So my question. Can you introduce yourself. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm Geetanjali from Lead. Um, so uh, my question to you is, sir, uh, someone who's been on both sides, 
uh, in the science area, uh, uh, public health domain, and in the policy making space. Uh, not making space, sh shaping uh, yeah, maybe. Shaping. Policy shaping space. Okay. Um, A policy screaming space. <laughs> Where do, we, where do you see we are as a country in adopting health technologies? I know there are more basic uh, issues, but uh, I think technology can also scale up some of the issues that we have. Uh, where we are in adopting some of these? Well, I think health technologies are important, valuable, and are receiving a great deal of attention. Uh, partly because they are seen as useful for bridging many of the gaps in access, quality, and affordability of health services. Telehealth, for example, was illegal before COVID, but it was rapidly legalized during COVID. And now, Digital Health Mission is not only looking at things like electronic health records and medical records, but looking at telehealth services, uh, looking at uh, management services, uh, like looking at uh, monitoring drug supplies, preventing stockouts, uh, enabling health insurance payouts, all of that is being digitally enabled. But a lot of technologies can be very helpful, especially technologies for primary care, point of care diagnostics. If you can take primary care to home or close to home and, can, and have many of the conditions diagnosed and treated, uh, that will be absolutely great. I think there is a fair amount of energy behind uh, the move to deliver on uh, some of the technologies to the digital health mission and otherwise. And there are so many young tech entrepreneurs wanting to develop technologies. The problem is many of them do not know where to apply those technologies or the relevance of those technologies. So you require people in the health system, the public health, and even the consumers and the people, uh, I don't like to use the word consumers, but the people who are actually going to be served, all of them to sit together and say, okay, what is the need? And how useful is this technology likely to be if it is de developed? So that's why, again, you cannot have an engineer developing a technology without understanding what the end user is going to be, or a public health person asking for a technology without knowing the complexity of the technology. So you need all of them to sit together and then work together. But that effort is going on. However, we must also recognize that technology cannot solve all problems of our health system. We are very short of human resources in health, particularly at the front end. To utilize those technologies properly, also you need human resources at the front end. And unless you recognize that, uh, there's a challenge. Technologies can be selective, particularly for those who are lazy. <laughs> because they don't want to undertake hard reforms uh, of changing the system. So for, for those who, uh, let me say, I wouldn't say lazy, for those who have no patience. So I think we need technologies, but we cannot see them as the only solution. Uh, my name is Abha Rao. Um, I, I um, thank you for an excellent talk. We've known for decades that public spending on health needs to be around five to six percent of the GDP, and yet, for decades we have spent. I mean, we've hovered around the two percent mark at best. What what is the what is the reluctance? What is the resistance to increasing that spending to something more meaningful? And this is, of course, across governments and so on. Why have we not managed to? I think the highest we've been is two point four percent in the last few years, not even that much. So, but no. I, why, why? <laughs> 1.2 is the no, estimate, no, no. Though, though the health minister, very, I mean, the finance minister, I wouldn't call it slate of hand, but very artfully uh, increased the health budget by bringing in nutrition, water and sanitation, sanitation. air pollution under it. I mean, uh, she should be congratulated for looking at health in a holistic manner, <laughs> but nevertheless, but I think that's been a major challenge. Uh, I think partly because of the two arguments, the economist saying that the fiscal space is very restricted, which is doc what uh, Dr. Yasla keeps pointing out. The second is, uh, I mean, there are other areas where 
state expenditure could be cut down. Uh, but um, the second is, uh, I mean, and within there, the not only central funding, but state funding has to increase. Many of the state budgets are still very below par on health. Uh, the second, of course, is uh, the argument that you do not have the absorption capacity. You're not spending what you're getting. That's a very standard uh, argument. Also somewhat true. Uh, somewhat true. It is somewhat true. But then the constraints have to be understood. That's right. Why is it that it's not being spent? So we have to definitely ask for much more, but also, may, I mean, Professor Ramalinga Swami, who was uh, the Director of All India Institute of Medical Sciences and also uh, Director General of ICMR, uh, said we need more money for health and more health for the money. Uh, that was when he was a uh, member of uh, International Commission uh, that was borrowed later on by Gordon Brown without attribution. <laughs> uh, hello, sir. Uh, this is Sudrip. Uh, I'm a student of public policy. And uh, it was a nice session with you. And my question is that, uh, as you know that today, in today's uh, time, that the Yunani, homeopathy, Ayurveda, these are getting, you know, quite in the verge of extinction. So I think people have some demand about, you know, the or dem means what I'm trying to say is that people want this kind of discipline or health technology to be there. So what should be the government's ambition means what go how can government and community help in you know protecting this kind of uh, medical processes and methods? In general in India, but also globally, there is a greater acceptance that traditional systems of medicine have a role to play. Now, what is the exact role they play? is to be determined based on whatever demonstrated value is there. In terms of health promotion and disease prevention, there's a great deal of role to play. Because we know allopathy also agrees that there are several ways of life which determine whether you are likely to get increased risk of disease or lower your risk of disease. And that knowledge is also something that traditional systems of medicine have projected for a long time in terms of eating habits, sleeping habits, or other, uh, other uh, uh, elements of daily life. They may also have value in reducing some of the severity of chronic illness. That also, I mean, obviously some acute infections, surgeries, they will not be able to deal with it straight away. So we'll have to recognize where they can be useful, where they may not be useful. But I think the idea of complementary systems of medicine and trying to see where the added value can be there from either, that would be very helpful. I think the actual scientific credibility of these systems will go up. Uh, if we can actually do proper research while being respectful of the fact that some of the traditional tools we use for assessment may not necessarily be applicable there. You may have to do different types of studies, N of 1 trials and things like that, rather than you know the classical uh, studies. But again, science is pushing us towards that wisdom because you are talking about microbiome. We are talking about trillions of bacteria living in the gut who are determining your nutrition, who are determining your immunity, you are determining a uh, lot of things about your body. And um, Ayurveda sort of said food is important and that determines how your body is going to function as a whole. Uh, as I said, uh, sciences, we have been trained in a very reductionist fashion, whereas these have been trained in a much more holistic fashion. So we should try and bring them together. Uh, same thing about um, epigenetics. We know that our living habits actually modify our gene expression. So, therefore, again, the traditional systems of medicine do emphasize the value of different ways of living. We need to bring in all that wisdom, but we must still try and evaluate as much as possible how much of value and credibility is there by whatever scientific methods we can develop. Uh, not be intolerant, and at the same time not be gullible. Otherwise, we are seeing the way gullibility of people is being taken advantage by charlatans, I'll not name them. Sir, my question is on universal coverage. 
when we're talking about universal coverage, what is happening is we are having Aishman Bharat, an insurance scheme. In Karnataka also, we had insurance schemes for you know helping people minimize uh, their expenditure on health. Then we also, through NHM, have free medicines at PHC, free diagnostics now. But uh, why go to insurance in the first place, and why not? It may be a very naive question. Why not just provide, like NHS, why not provide free care, better quality care? Why do we have to go through the insurance route and another complication like that? I completely agree with you. In fact, uh, insurance should have a very minimal role if we can have a good tax-funded system. One of the problems, as Dr. Vyasla has been pointing out, is that our tax-to-GDP ratio is very low. And there is very little appetite among policymakers for increasing their tax rates because they feel that investment will not come. Uh, but uh, whatever may happen, we unless we allocate more tax revenues, you will not be able to develop a um, system which is totally um, tax funded and uh, not dependent on insurance. Uh, tax funded systems will create the largest risk pool. You see, one of the why, why do you do insurance? Because you want to create a risk pool where the healthy will at any given time cross subsidize the sick. The if it is, but in a tax funded system, it will happen. But there will also be the fact that in a progressive tax system, the rich will also cross subsidize the poor. So the equity dimension is also coming in. So the tax funded system is the best. But that means you must have sufficient amount of taxes. So, but at least make sure that essential elements like primary care, some of the essential elements of secondary care, life-saving elements of tertiary care are provided by the tax-funded system. And progressively, maybe other elements been covered later on. Thank you so much. Just one final comment. Sure. Uh, the session was titled also about other social determinants of health. I haven't done much justice to that. But social determinants are absolutely critical. A British economist called Tony in the 1920s and 30s Incidentally, he happened to be a, a socialist clergyman. Uh, he, in his book, Equality, he says, equality of opportunity is decorous drapery. He says, what you need is not equality of opportunity, but equality of circumstances. You need an equal start not just an open road. So social determinants of health become very, very important.